Whenever you want to learn to program a new processor at the assembly language level, the first thing you need to understand is its instruction set architecture, or ISA. Well, what do we mean by that term? What is an instruction set architecture? First of all, it consists of those places where the processor stores or obtains information. Probably the most important of those will be the registers. We know that, that a processor has many thousands of registers that are not visible to the programmer, but when we talk about registers as part of the instruction set architecture, we mean those registers that are available for use as scratch pad memory or short term memory. These registers will be physically located very close to the processor's ALU and they're designed to be very fast at the expense of using more power and more transistors. Then we'll usually have what's conventionally known as memory associated with the processor. And there will typically be two main kinds of memory. The flash memory is where the program software is stored which is non-volatile memory, so its contents are preserved even when the power is turned off and then immediately available when the power is turned back on. The second type of memory is called RAM. Most of the variables used by the program will be stored in RAM. The contents of RAM will be undefined when power is turned on. We also need to know something about I.O. devices, the input-output devices. They allow the processor to communicate with the outside world. It inc would include things such as USB interfaces, analog to digital converters, and graphic display controllers. Even the most simple interfaces, such as a blinking and LED, require that the processor communicates with I.O. devices. Some processors have special instructions to talk to I.O. devices, but the Cortex-M processors treat the I.O. devices as though they were just another kind of memory. We need to know how the processor manipulates data, which means we need to understand the assembly language instructions. Processors like the Cortex-M family can't execute programs in a high-level language, language like C or Java directly. Each statement in a program must be converted to a sequence of assembly language instructions, which are the native programming language of the particular processor. The assembly language instructions for a given processor depend on the processor's hardware architecture, and the architecture of different processors may vary greatly depending on how the designers chose to optimize the processor for low-cost, low-power consumption, or high performance. In a sense, understanding a processor's assembly language gives the programmer a model of the processor architecture. Most of the code written for embedded applications is written in a high-level language, but it's also true that most embedded programming projects will require some code to be written in assembly language. We may also need to know something about the processor's hardware actions. A microcontroller may change the flow of program execution, change the values and registers under direct control of the processor hardware itself. For example, if the processor has to respond to a fault condition, then the processor will take control of program execution and do something special. Well, let's start by looking at the registers in the Cortex-M ISA. This architecture has 16 generic registers, which means in general that any of these registers can be used as an operand of an assembly language instruction that requires a register operand. The truth though is that there are really 13 that are intended for general purpose use, registers 0 through 12. They can hold data or an address, and it's important to remember that the registers don't know whether their contents are data or an address. And it's up to you as the programmer to keep track of that. In the basic definition of, this, of the Cortex-M processors, there are three data types. Bytes of 8 bits, half words of 16 bits, and full words of 32 bits. The definition of a word is not standard, but when we're talking about the Cortex-M, a word will be 32 bits. Three of the registers have a very special purpose. Register 13 is the stack pointer. And you may know that the stack is a very important data structure that's dynamically allocated in the RAM memory. The stack pointer keeps track of the memory address that holds the last value stored on the stack. 
Many processors don't treat the stack pointer as a generic register, but doing so makes it very easy to access data on the stack, as we'll see. Register 14 is also the link register. Whenever you call a subroutine in the Cortex-M architecture, the link register automatically is loaded with the return address. So at the end of the subroutine, we use the value in the link register to get back to the calling program. Register 15 is the program counter. The program counter is usually maintained directly by the processor hardware and contains the address of the next assembly instruction that will be executed. So one way to perform a go-to in assembly language is just to load the program counter with the address of the next instruction you want to execute. But that's generally a very bad idea. It will be useful, however, to be able to use the program counter as a pointer to access constants that are used by the code, as we shall see later. Now let's talk about the Cortex-M memory space. Well, the Cortex-M processors have a full 32-bit address that supports four Gibby bytes, that's four times two to the 30th bytes of memory space. So memory addresses in this processor will range from 32 bits that are all zeros to 32 bits that are all ones. That's eight Fs, F, 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 F. And an important aspect of the Cortex-M architecture is that code, data, and I.O. devices share the same memory space. So that means that I.O. devices are memory mapped, and it means that code and data appear to be part of the same memory space, even though physically the buses that communicate with these things may be different. As we mentioned before, the data types, the basic data types stored in memory can be bytes, half words, and words. And that's really all the processor knows about. It doesn't know what that data means to you. It's up to you to keep track of that. Because the processor allows data values that are bytes, the memory addresses are byte addresses. So a particular memory address specifies a particular byte in memory. And if the processor needs to access a half word, it will fetch a byte at the byte address and then the byte at the subsequent byte address. Likewise, if we need to access an entire word in memory, the processor begins at the specified byte address, but also accesses the next three byte addresses to get a full 32-bit word. You may need to know that there are predefined regions within the memory map, as it's specified by ARM, and those regions have different distinct characteristics. For example, some of the regions, the ones marked in blue in this diagram, are considered executable, which means that you can execute instructions in that address space. Trying to execute an instruction that's not in one of the executable spaces will cause a fault condition to occur. Some of the spaces are considered device spaces or strongly ordered spaces, which means that accesses to different addresses in those, those spaces have to occur in the same sequence that they're specified in the code. An advanced processor may reorder accesses to, to memory, and we don't allow that to happen when the memory space is actually occupied by some sort of a hardware interface. And then finally, some spaces are considered to be shareable. Um, in particular, the RAM spaces and the external devices are considered to be shareable, which means that in a multiprocessor system or with a peripheral that's able to access memory directly, uh, we can allow multiple devices to access the same memory space. You'll probably be most concerned with that part of the memory space that's on chip. Most of the microcontrollers we will use will have the really important stuff all on chip. So let's talk about what we have. Note that these three segments of the memory space, code, SRAM, static RAM, and the peripheral space, are located in the first one and a half Gibby byte of memory space and that each is allocated a half of a Gibby byte, even though it may use much, much less than that.
And even though it appears to the programmer that these are all part of the same memory space, they actually may use physically separate buses, which means that we can be accessing code, fetching instructions from code, at the same time we're fetching data from RAM or working with peripherals in the peripheral space. The processor architecture, by definition, by specification, does have space allocated for off-chip data and off-chip devices or peripherals, one gigabyte each for those two spaces. We don't usually see processors that support external memory because an off-chip memory bus requires lots of pins, which means that the package will be very large and expensive and that we'll need a lot of power to wiggle those pins. So off-chip memory is, is usually not something that we'll see in the processors that we deal with. And then finally, there's one half gigabyte at the very top of the memory map that includes a vendor specific area that is it's completely up to the microcontroller manufacturer to specify what happens in that space and also this private peripheral space or private peripheral bus space which occupies just the first one mebibyte of that half gibibyte region. And what we'll find in this private peripheral space are the registers that set up, configure, and control the peripherals that are a mandatory part of the architecture. For example, the nested vectored interrupt controller, standard interrupt controller for all Cortex-M processors, and so there's a standard definition of the registers that control it. The system tick timer is used for controlling the flow of multitasking in real-time operating systems. It's a standard part of the Cortex-M architecture. It's controlled by registers in this space. A system for fault status and control exists here if we do things like divide by zero or attempt to execute instructions in a non-executable part of the memory space, a fault will occur and we have to have a standard way of dealing with that. And then finally, the registers for processor debugging. I know that most of you always write code that works perfectly the very first time, but it seems that I invariably make some mistakes. When the software doesn't work as expected in an embedded microcontroller system, it can be extremely difficult to debug. The system may have very limited I.O. capabilities. Imagine trying to get debug information from a system that has a few sensors as input devices and a motor controller as its only output device. Even if the system does have some I.O. device that can send debugging messages, you may not have enough program memory to add debugging code to the application. And Murphy's Law often dictates that real-time systems will only fail when running in real-time. Unfortunately, debugging can consume a large portion of the schedule and budget when developing an embedded project. To make debugging easier on even the simplest of the Cortex-M applications, ARM has created a standard debugging interface. This block of hardware allows you to execute one instruction at a time and observe how the registers and memory are changing, or to run at full speed until a particular instruction is executed. You will quickly come to love the debugging interface. Well, what are the key points we've talked about? Remember that the Cortex-M architecture has 16 generic registers, but only 13 of those are truly general purpose, registers that you can use for scratch pad memory. Three of them have a special purpose. Registers 13, 14, and 15 are the stack pointer, the link register, and the program counter. Remember that ARM has specified the Cortex-M memory space and that program code, data, and I.O. share that same memory space. Because the memory map is predefined by ARM, it's much easier to develop applications for one ARM processor and port them to another. That's the basic Cortex-M instruction set architecture. Thanks for watching.